name is Allison Miette, and I am the Collections and Community Engagement Manager. Is being recorded. That was very loud in my ears. <laughs> at the Fishing Heritage Center. Um, I'm super excited to be here with historian, poet, and all around wonderful woman, Katrina Porteous, to hear what she has to say about women in North Oberlin's fishing industry. Um, initially from Aberdeen, Scotland, Katrina has lived on the, the Northumberland coast for over 30 years, recording the lives of fishermen and women. She has published several, several oral histories and poetry and won a Chumbly Award <laughs> in 2021. Um, today's program is part of our Women's Work Series, which is a year-long project exploring the roles of women in fishing communities that is funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Women's Fisheries Network, Mass Cultural Council, and the New Bedford, Fairhaven, Dartmouth, Westport, Marion, and Mattapoisett Cultural Councils, as well as the Women's Fund South Coast. So quickly, before I turn it over to Katrina, just want to mention another virtual event that's happening on March 18th um, from the center. This is a book talk by Allie Farrell, who is a author from Maine that has chronicled stories from fishing women in her book, Pretty Rugged, True Stories from Women of the Sea. And then I have the calendar link right here in the chat. Um, you can also keep following our Facebook and Instagram pages and check the uh, calendar that we have on our website, which is this right here. And with that, I will send it over to Katrina. Alison, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone at, at um, New Bedford Fishing Heritage Centre. And also to um, Low Lights Heritage Centre in North Shields, across the water, because uh, on my side of the water, because I think some, some people are joining us from there. So thank you all for coming to, to, to hear this talk today. It's really exciting to be talking um, to the to, to, to a different continent and, and, and very unusual for me. Um, as Alison explained, this talk is about women's lives here in Northumberland. I'll show you a map in a minute to show you where we are. Um, and it only really goes up to about World War II. So it might seem rather limited in, in scope, but I hope in the course of the talk that you'll see that it has some wider applications. And I think you know there, there are probably applications for, for where you are too. And um, there's, there'll be time for questions at the end. I'll talk for about 50 minutes and um, th then, then open it up for, for, for any questions that you have. So we're going to, I, 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 I'll put the screen up in a minute, but I'll just explain what I'm going to talk about. First of all, we're going to look first at how women appear in visual representations on the coast and, and look at some archetypes for how women were depicted in the past and how these relate to the reality of women's lives. So we'll look at how women were, the, were absolutely vital for the staple whitefish on the Northumberland coast, the whitefish industry, um, how important they were for fish processing and selling. Uh, we'll look at their involvement in the more industrialized and probably better known herring fishery. Um, then we'll consider how far back the pre-industrial side of the fishing actually stretches, how far back it can be traced. And we'll think a little bit about why all that matters for us today. What I won't be talking about is women going to sea. Um, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, it was almost unheard of, really, until modern times. It was exceedingly rare for women to set foot on boats. And uh, although there are some women um, skippers now and women in the fishing now, it's still much more unusual in, in Britain than it is in America. Um, I've, I've, in the last decade, I've been in touch with the Fisher Poets in uh, over on the west coast of America, and I've met some fantastic women skippers there. Um, but that is unusual here. However, I, I do know of one woman skipper, um, trawler, trawler skipper, who may be joining us from North Shields. Um, so it's not unheard of, but it was certainly unheard of in the past. So I won't be talking about women going to sea, just the land based activities. So I'm going to you'll just have to bear with me for a second while I um, try to share the screen with you so you can see um, the pictures I'd like to show you. So I hope you can all see that. Can you can can somebody stick their stick their thumbs up in there? That's great. Thanks, Laura. That's fantastic. Um, so 
We'll start with this picture. This is um, one you might be familiar with because this is an American artist, Winslow Homer. But Winslow Homer came to the Northumbrian coast in 1881 and he spent um, about 18 months here. Um, and all the time he was living here, he was working, depicting the working lives of, of fisher, fisher people in the village of Colourcoats, which is in the south part of Northumberland, near Tyneside. And um, his, his paintings of the fisher people are very famous. Uh, and, and really when he went there, he joined a community of people who were already depicting the fisher people. There was a small um, colony of artists in colour coats to begin with. But Homer in particular was fascinated, I think, by the women. He's, he, he concentrated on women's lives. And he sort of set up a kind of archetype, I think, of someone depicted in art as, as the bonny fisher lass, this really pretty, um, rather romantic, but also very strong and self-assured woman. And th 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 this is a, a picture of just such a person. This is uh, Maggie Jefferson, um, who was at the time only about 13 years old. Um, so uh, Ma Maggie Jefferson was, was Homer's muse, really, and he painted her many, many times. She's standing here. She, she's depicted not at Colour Coats, but further down the coast at Flamborough in Yorkshire. Um, and she's wearing the traditional costume of the Fisher Lass, the apron, the quite short skirt for the time. The, 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 her, her stance is very self-assured with her hands on her hips. And look at what she's wearing on her back, that huge creel. And I'll be talking much more later in the talk about, about um, what that was for, and what, what it was used for. Um, but this is it's a very um, typical kind of image of the Fisher Woman in, in Winslow Homer's work. Um, she, she was, as I say, his favourite model and he paid her a shilling a day um, and in fact invited her to return to America with him. But she was, remember, only a teenager and she declined and she ended up marrying a fisherman in her home village called William Story. And she had 17 children and sort of founded a dynasty. I think she still has many um, descendants in, in the village of Colourcoats to this day. But the point about showing this picture to start with is really about this archetype and the type that um, Maggie Jefferson represented for Homer, because at this time, colour coats down near Tyneside, Tyneside was a very industrial area. This was the, the, the industrial revolution of the 19th century. Tyneside was being industrialised, um, very important for coal export, very urban. And Maggie Jefferson and the Fisher lasses that around about her represented for Homer something that was backward looking, really, and pre-industrial and in some way represented virtue and something that was uncorrupted and old fashioned, even at the time, I think. So just keep that in your mind as we go through looking at these pictures and talking about the, the women in them. So this is a map for, for those of you who uh, who don't live in the northeast of England. It's important that you should know where we're talking about. So this is this is the British Isles. This is the Scottish border, right? This is all Scotland up here. That's the Scottish border. And this part of the coast from here to here is Northumberland. So from Berwick down to Colourcoats, just south of Colourcoats. That's where Winslow Homer was working at Colourcoats. And all the way down the coast down to here, this is Yorkshire, this part of the coast. All of this coast was really characterized by a particular sort of fishing from a particular sort of vessel. And this is the kind of fishing that I'll be talking about in, in this talk. I should have said at the beginning that the sources for this talk, really the primary source is, is oral. It's from my many years of talking to people, to women in this talk who worked in the fishing industry. Um, and that's supplemented by contemporary accounts written in the late 19th, early 20th century, um, and then supplemented by the visual record, which we'll be seeing, and also by some 
some some research which I've done more recently into much older records. Um, I, I worked with a, a, another historian, Dr. Adrian Osler, on some medieval records relating to fishing in this area. And I would like to talk about how women's lives in the within living memory of the time when I was working in, in, in the 1980s and 90s, how their lives relate to the medieval lives, because there was a real, there were elements of real continuity, I think. So this coast, this whole of this coast from the top of Berwick up here down to Bridlington down here in Yorkshire is all the coast characterized by this vessel, which is a coble. You might be able to see a model of one in the in the back there, um, which a fisherman made. But this is the traditional working boat of the Northumberland and Yorkshire coast, which has been characterized by some as the coble coast. And it was traditionally a sailing vessel. After World War I, um, they got motors in them. So within my, my lifetime, they've always been motor vessels, but they were traditionally sailed with a dipping lug like that. And they're open boats, they're quite small. They're crewed by three or four men. And one of the characteristic features of them is they are flat bottomed aft. They have a very deep forefoot um, uh, forward and then a flat bottom aft so they can be drawn up on the beach and launched off the beach. They don't require harbours. So they're very versatile boats for, for this coast of northeast England. Um, and the staple fishing from this kind of boat was really the winter fishing, the, 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 the fishing that brought in the most money was from October to about the end of March and was done with long lines. And this was for white fish such as cod and haddock, which was the highest priced fish. Um, so, so the long line fishery of the winter was very important. Um, then in the summer, uh, they would fish from these boats. Traditionally, further back in the past, they would fish for herring with nets from, from cobles, but that changed in the 19th century. And I will be talking about that later. Um, they also fished, because it was a very mixed fishery, they fished for crabs in the spring and they fished for lobster in the autumn. And they also fished for salmon um, at night with these boats. So uh, a, 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 a versatile fishery where um, if one fishing didn't do so well, they could rely on a different part of the fishery um, to, to, to make more money over the year. And it was seasonal. Um, and these boats were used from all the villages on the northeast coast. And women were an absolutely integral part of this working economy. And at the time when Homer was painting in the 1880s, already there was a, the beginnings of a sort of tourist industry with gentry people coming to the coast and admiring and watching the fishing people at work. So what Homer was doing was depicting that as part of that um, influx of visitors already interested in what they saw as a, a slightly old fashioned way of life. So this is another drawing of, of Homer's of a coble at sea. And what will strike you about this already from my talk, I, I've said that women didn't go to sea. And of course, he is, here he's depicted um, two women in a coble. But what's striking to me about this beautiful drawing is not only the animation of the boat, which is fantastic, but the way that the men are, are faceless and looking out to sea and the women are, you can see them as characters, you can see their faces and they're looking landward. So the women belong to the land, the men belong to the sea. The women have with them a big creel, they're probably coming back either from gathering bait or, or more likely from selling fish. Um, and there's a distinction between the women's roles and the men's roles, even aboard that boat. And there are out to sea, you can see the sort of shadowy figure of a, of, of a steamboat. And I think Homer is, is already drawing your attention again to the fact that this is a rather antiquated way of life, even, even there in the, in the late 19th century. And here is modernity in the background in the form of the steamboat. Um, the, the, it was a real paradox about women not going to sea because, of course, they were so, so important to the fishing economy. And yet they were considered to be not only not, not allowed to go to sea, but they were considered to be unlucky uh, in boats, even in, in, around boats. You, you didn't have women in the boat. You didn't have women around the boat. And yet the paradox was that they were needed around the boats because of their working lives. So there was this tension already in the, in the, in the fishing culture. And um, it, so much so that all the way down the coast and in Scotland as well, um, it was considered unlucky for a fisherman to meet a woman on his way to the sea early in the morning. And it, some would even turn back and wouldn't go to sea that day because it was so unlucky. 
Um, fishermen always said that they wanted sons and not daughters, so much so that I can remember uh, a, a, a woman from the fishing community saying to me that when, when she was born, she'd already had three sisters, and when she was born, Father slammed the door. He, 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 he was so angry, he just slammed the door. He didn't want another daughter, he wanted sons, and yet they couldn't operate without them. Um, so let's have a look at another Homer picture. This is this is a picture on the beach at Cullicoats and a more typical picture, really, because here are the women on the land looking out, away out to sea and the men, the men are at, at sea. So this distinction between the women's roles and the men's were, were, were being our attentions being drawn to that in the painting. And this is a famous painting of, of, of Homer's, um, the three fisher, fisher lasses on the shore. And it's often written about, um, it's called Hark the Lark, and it's often written about as if they were uplifted by the sound of the lark. But to me, the interpretation of this painting is that it's, it's full of foreboding. You can't really see the sea in the painting. There's only a tiny glimpse of it there in the background, and they're, they're staring out to sea, and their faces look anxious, and they're, they're, they're burdened with work. The one on the left is carrying a big net on her back. The other two are carrying baskets, which seem to be full. They look as though they're full of seaweed but in fact they'll be full of bait underneath the seaweed the seaweed was used to keep the bait um, cool and, 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 and moist so um, they're, they're, they're working working lasses and again this archetype of the bonnie fisher lass they're very they're, they're, they're pretty girls that depicted as innocent in, innocent girls work, working and sort of virtuous through their labor but they're looking away out to sea at the at the danger that the sea represents because fishing is of course and small boat fishing is a very very dangerous way of life it remains so to this day whoops sorry let's go back whoops we've gone the wrong way oh dear i'm not i'm not sure if i can go back so i'm just going to come out of this for a second go back to the It doesn't seem to want to go backwards, so I don't know. I don't know why that is, and that's a shame. No, it won't go backwards. Does Does anybody, Laura? Do you know how we can make this go backwards? Probably not. I I think if you uh, maybe exit the slideshow. Yeah, it's, going, it's 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 doing it. It's doing it with a different command. This is. Uh, there's a long story to this, but anyway, I, I've made it. I've made it go backwards. So we're back where we we're back where we should be. So this is a painting actually by a woman, and I want to juxtapose it for a second with that we were looking at by Winslow Homer, because there are the Bonnie Fisher lasses. But this is a very different sort of expression. I'm sure. I'm sure you can see that um, th these women are not so romantically depicted. Um, this is this is Isa Thompson. Who was one of one of the color coats group when um, when Homer went there? They, she and her husband Robert Jobling were already living in color coats, and and they they moved about the coast. This it's it has been said that this painting is probably at Staithes in Yorkshire. I'm not so sure. The, the the woman with the basket on her head is wearing what's known as a known now as a Staithes bonnet because um, the the fisherwomen in in Staithes were practically the last to wear them. But in fact, that kind of bonnet was worn all over the northeast coast at the end of the 19th century so I don't think there's a way of of knowing exactly where this is um and and unless you know but by the date that's possible but but anyway these these two women could could just as well be at color coats as it states one of them is gathering wood uh firewood the other one is carrying bait for the long lines on in a basket on her head and 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 also carrying bait in in a basket um, on her wrist, and their depiction is 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 much more formidable. I think it's a much more challenging painting than the Homer painting. Um, you can see the deprivation, I think, in that painting. That the the dour colours, the black, that signifies that one of them is a widow. The black bonnet. Um, so so that and they're also quite masculine, I think, in their depiction, which is interesting. So. Um, it is it is a very different image of of fisher women than the ones the ones in 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 some of uh, Homer's paintings. 
Now, this is, this is just a candid photograph from early in the 20th century. I don't actually know who this woman is, but I think she's um, related to the Robinson family because it was one of the Robinsons who gave, gave me the picture. And she seems to me to depict really another kind of archetype that is often thought of when you think of women in the fishing or connected to the fishing industry. Not the Bonnie Fisher lass, but the other one, the fishwife. Now, if I say fishwife, to all of you, what does that what does that image conjure up to you? It's probably somebody who's very strong willed, um, probably quite outspoken, um, rather independent, sharp tongued, maybe argumentative. That that term fishwife is used demotically to mean all of those things. And of course, wife traditionally didn't mean somebody married. It just meant a woman. So um, if a, a fish woman, and it's it's an old expression. It goes back, uh, really, I think, certainly into the 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 seventeenth century and possibly earlier. And um, she was depicted in 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 art and in cartoons, even you know, from from the late eighteenth century, as someone who was very forthright. There's a there's a very early nineteenth century political cartoon that shows a bunch of fishwives setting sail for France to tell the French politicians what to do because the British prime minister wasn't strong enough. So um, this is a kind of tradition of that, I think, rather in this country. <laughs> So uh, anyway, the fishwife was a kind of alternative archetype for what women um, in the fishing industry, or how women in the fishing industry were depicted. So here's another bonny fisher lass, and this one is um, this one is an interesting photograph. It's from the work of Frank Meadow Sutcliffe, who worked in Yorkshire in Whitby at the end of the 19th century, and. This was when photography was really quite a new a new art form. And Sutcliffe was a fantastic documenter of people's actual lives in Whitby. Although many or most of his photographs are posed, he was documenting social history at the time, really. This is a woman called, or a girl, called Lizzie Alice Hawksfield. Um, and Lizzie, I believe Lizzie, in the end, emigrated to Australia and lived to be a, a ripe old age. I think she died in uh, in 1961, so she had a, a long life. But as a young girl, she she worked um, uh, as as women did in the industry, baiting the long lines. I'm going to be talking about them in a minute, but that's what she's carrying. This is a half line on a line swirl, um, and this was really this is what women's lives consisted of. As I say, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about the long lines in just a second. But um, when the men were risking their lives at sea, women spent their days really work, working with these things. There's a basket of bait behind her there. You can see uh, mussels piled up in that in that creel behind her. And this long line was 700 hooks long. And each man took two of those to sea. So that's 1,400 hooks. And on each of those hooks, uh, I'll show you some some long line hooks if you can just see that. That's can you see that little little hook there, a tiny little thing. On each of those little hooks, there had to be at least one muscle, often two, and often a, a limpet as well to keep the muscle on the hook. They were called hooks, um, and they had to be laid. Each one had to be put on very very carefully, and they had to be laid in very very neat rows very particular in a very particular way back and forth in the swirl so that when they were shot at sea from the cobble they didn't get fooled they didn't get tangled up so baiting a line was a very very particular art form and you learnt it at your mother's knee so lizzie in this picture she looks i don't know how old she'd be about 15 probably in that picture she would already have been doing that for years uh, this is a picture from from a little bit later from from Newbigin, and it shows a, an older woman there with a, a line swirl, um, hard at work baiting a line. The, the the men have already come back from the sea. That's probably her her husband there next to her, or possibly her son. Um, and the men, of course, the men worked incredibly hard and they risked their lives. They went out really early in the morning, but. If anybody worked harder, it was the women, I think, because the men, at least when they got home, they stopped work. Some, sometimes they had to help with the lines, it's true, but they did get to relax a little bit more than the women, I think, did. So, um, there, as I said, there were three or four men aboard a coble, each of them taking 
1,400 hooks baited line to sea with them. Um, and if you had more than one man at home, if you had a couple of sons and your husband, you had three lines to do in a day. And you started by having to go out in the dark, usually, or very, very early in the morning, gathering these things off the rocks, because you had to gather the mussels and the limpets, and then shell them, skin them, as they called it, take them out of their shells, before you could even start to put them on the hooks. Each line took about three hours to bait if you were extremely skilled at it. So if you had a couple of men in the house, you already had six hours work on, on top of everything else you had to do as a woman. Um, so this was an incredibly demanding way of life, really. Um, and, and women women never never stop working. Uh, this is another another Sutcliffe uh, photograph. There's a fantastic website. We, you can see the the um, the address for it at the bottom there. But do have a look at that because Frank Meadows Sutcliffe's work is just is just wonderful. I think and gives you a real insight into what people's lives were like. Um, you can see the woman carrying the half line in the swirl on her head. They protected their heads with a, a rolled up clute, a cloth called a wheeze. Um, but but th they must have been incredibly strong because I tell you, when a line like that was wet, a hemp line is wet, it, it's about as much as I can do to lift it, let alone carry it on my head. I don't think I could do that. So th th these, these women had a tremendous physical strength. And you can also see in the photograph you know, she's she's wearing a very ragged apron. She does she does have boots on her feet. Some sometimes they're depicted not wearing, not even wearing anything on their feet. You know, they 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 were not well off. They, they, there was deprivation in these communities, and it was a very a very hard way of life. Um, that woman's name is Bella Bachelor, by the way. She's identified on the uh, on on the Sutcliffe site. This is uh, in my own village of Beadnell. This is um, um, the aunt yeah. of some of the fishermen and, and yeah, women yeah. I knew. Can, can, can whoever has their, their microphone switched on, could, could they put themselves, the please? Yeah. Would it be possible for you to yeah. mute yourself? Thank you. Um, so this is this is uh, Kate Douglas in Beadnell, just before the First World War, and you can see the line swirl there and the way that the, the, the muscles on the hooks are laid out. In the in the line swirl, very carefully. And this is this is another village just down the coast from me. This is Annie Jane Nelson in Craster. And again, the coiled line in the swirl, and then the the, the sneeds, the, the, the this bit with the the hook on, is is laid out in front of the line so that when the men went to sea, they could just shoot it very. Um, uh, mechanically really and and there was no tangling so th this is very careful way of doing it um this very young girl she's about 12 in this picture Nell nelly archibald can you see the creel on her back and it's quite a small creel now she would be going down the rocks to gather some of the limpets um that were pushed as well as the mussels on the rocks they used to use a thing called a picker which is basically just a blade on a handle, that, that, there's one, um, to, to knock the limpets off the rocks, because it's quite hard work getting limpets off the rocks. And you, if you needed, you know, 1,400, that's a lot of limpets. <laughs> so it's a lot of work just doing that. So the, the, the children, the, the very young girls, would be sent down the rocks to do that. Um, and, and they grew up carrying these huge weights, really, on their backs, so that by the time they were adults, they could carry in the bigger creels between four four and six stone a fish at a time. Um, let's see what time it is. I'll see if I can. I haven't really got time to read you this. I've, I've got some lovely first hand accounts, but I'm not going to. You'll just have to have me back another day to, to read them out because they, they, they do take a little bit too long, I think. But uh, it, the, 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 the accounts of people who actually did this and the, the, the time that it took to do it. And if you hadn't grown up with it, essentially, it was so difficult to learn how to do it with the, the speed and the dexterity that it took to skein the muscles and the limpets. You, 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 you used um, you, you used a teaspoon to do the, the, the limpets, but you, the, to do with the muscles, it was a very particular way of taking them out of their shell with a, a, a knife like that. It was always a sort of cut down knife that they used. And um, it had to be done in a particular way. And then they had to put, put on the hook in a particular way so that they were sort of turned over on the hook. So it was very, very skilled work. 
and um, you had to, you learned it at your mother's knee. And if you married a fisherman and didn't come from a fishing family, it was very difficult to learn, I think. Um, this is this is just a little bit of archaeology from the village um, next to where I live. I'm, I'm fascinated by this because people don't these days don't know what these marks are, but they were made by the women going down to the rocks, sharpening their pickers, these these blades on the way down to collect the the, the limpets. And I just think it's a lovely memorial to them that they, they that stone with the, the the marks still exists in sea houses. Um, I'll, I'll read you this one because this is just a um, just a very short one. This is a, a woman from Sea Houses who said, I remember having to ski in the limpets. I did that on a morning before I went to school. I remember being very small and my sister and I having to do that while my mother did the mushels. We did them with a teaspoon and oh, the cold water. I can still feel that yet. Mother baited the line. You came home at dinner time and she'd made the dinner. But when I came home from school at half past three, the pans were still on the big fender and the dish were on the table because she had just had to get straight up from the dinner and get that line finished and you know sometimes I remember they were all knotted and she had such sore hands now this this part of the talk about the lines I'm going to just finish off with so that you can hear actually hear one of the women who I knew very well Kathy Armstrong talking about um, going to the lines and at the end of this talk, I'm going to read a poem about Kathy, but I'd just like you to see her picture and hear her voice. This is just a little excerpt, about a minute long. Well, as well as the lions, you had to come into the house when you had five minutes for to try to cook something than coming in. Mm -hmm. And especially when you are the only one. You're the only woman. I was the only woman and I had two men going up till William left school and then I had three. Mm -hmm. And I was the only one. Yeah. And not only that, mm. man and dad was old, yes. and, and they were always ailing, and I had to look after them. And the neighbours were... Yeah. Did you? I've looked after old people all my life, yeah. and I loved helping people. Yeah. That's very special. And many times, I used to, to go to chemist and get the plasters mm. or to put on my hands, because I always catch there when I was doing the mushrooms. Oh. And when it got that bad, yeah. it bled, you see, yes. and that's when I, <laughs> oh. I tell you the truth, to put my hands. Yes, what's that? I used to pray at night, but I had my hands fit for the next day. Yes. Well, that bad. Okay. And my neighbor, on a Sunday, she used to mix me pastry for us, because my hands was that bad, I couldn't mix the pastry for the next time. Oh. <laughs> so, the, the long lines, this very old way of fishing for white fish, really came to an end just after the, the Second World War. And, and what a good job it did, really, because it was just brutal on, on the women in, 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 in the fishing community. Uh, it was it was substituted by, by um, small scale trawlers, um, and which came in seine net boats and trawlers, which came in after the Second World War. But it went on until about 1950 in the villages on the coast where I live. So really, just a decade before I was born. So that's a tradition which which went back a very long way, as we'll see at the end of this talk. But I was very lucky to to know some of the women who'd who'd gone to that kind of fishing. Now, as well as doing that. Um, women were very heavily involved with processing and selling fish in the villages. So we'll talk a little bit about that. There isn't there isn't enough time to talk about everything. But um, this is this is colour coats again, where Winslow Homer was working, but a bit later, obviously, because it's a, a photograph from the 20th century. And this is again that that tradition of the fish wife, this 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 strong, independent, rather outspoken woman. You can see she's carrying the big creel on her back. She's got some massive fish in that creel and they will weigh, I, I don't know what they'll weigh, but I, as I say, the creel could, ca could contain up to about six stone of fish. And the women walked often for miles um, in, in, in colour coats, they had particular routes that they did and they they used the train to go out to some of the, the pit villages inland. Um, but in, in villages like mine, they just went on, on foot. And what used to happen was the fish was generally sold at an auction 
um, off the boat, but any glut, any fish that wasn't um, wasn't sold through the auction, anything that was left over, or if there was just a small catch that day and they weren't selling to the merchants, that fish was sold by the women carrying creels on their backs. So the, the traditional fishwife, like the colour coats fishwife, was really an urban phenomenon because they were connected to the towns and to Tyneside. But all the women in all the fishing villages did this as well as baiting the lines. They sold fish. And Kathy, who you just saw in the last photograph and heard speaking, Kathy was a very small person. She was only weighed about six stone and she carried nearly her own body weight in a creel on her back as a young woman selling fish around the doors. So they, again, they had to be tremendously strong. Um, women, women's involvement in selling fish and in processing fish as well uh, goes back a very, very long way. I've, I've got a, quite a bit of evidence from the medieval period and post-medieval period of women doing this. I, there's no time in this talk to go into that, but it, it, it is true that there's, there's, there was a long, long tradition of women selling, selling fish in England. Um, and also being in charge of the family finances in, in fishing families. So um, that, that seems to go back a long way as well. Um, let's have a look that the, the woman in that picture i think is probably the same woman or at least the same family as as, as the women in the next two pictures There we go. That's um, Bella Jefferson and Janie McCulley. And I, th I think that first picture is Bella Jefferson as well, but I, I, I'm, I'm not altogether sure. Someone might be able to put me right on that. Um, but th these two are boiling crabs, again, fish processing, uh, fish, a fisherman's wife and daughter, um, boiling crabs to sell. And um, in the next picture, um, that's Janie McCulley again with some processed crabs, selling them on a street corner in, uh, I, I think that's probably, um, probably colour coats or possibly no, tine mouth I think um, but there she is with, her, with with the creels to carry them and the baskets and again wearing the traditional uh, fishwife's um, costume and um, in, in this urban setting the, 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 the character of the fishwife and and that really again that went on right up until about the 1960s and that even that traditional dress into the 1950s um, so that was that was another big part of, of, of fishing women's lives um, when I say that it goes back a long way, I'll just I just want to show you this picture because this is a, a lovely um, picture from it's actually from an Italian manuscript, but it shows women in, in the medieval period in the 14th century, a, a woman selling a fish in the market. And as I say, I've got I've got records of that happening in, in this country as well, in, in Newcastle. And um, the, 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 the Durham Priory, the, the um, religious institution, kept records of the, the seller who, uh, who kept the food for the priory and what he bought and, and, and sold. And fish was a big part of monks' lives because, of course, the Catholic Church required you to, to fast on many, many days of the year and fasting involved eating fish. So fish was a big part of their lives and women are recorded as selling fish to the priory. So I thought I thought that was just a nice illustration of, of the continuity of that tradition and from where the fishwife emerged, um, the, the, the fishwife being a tradition that goes back a very long way. So we'll move on to another part of the women's lives now, um, which was the summer fishery. And this is a very different sort of sort of fishing involving different boats, not kobolds in the 19th and 20th century, but but bigger boats. Hmm. Bear with me, I'm sorry. I'm just having a little problem with the technology here. There we go. This is um, the herring industry. And when I use the word industry, it's more applicable for this. Everything that we've been talking about up until this point was an economy and was a way of life and um, was a, 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 an important fishery, but it wasn't really industrialised in the way that herring was. Herring had always been caught on the Northumberland coast. It goes back again to the 14th century. We have records of herring being caught, and I'm sure they were caught long before that, from cobles. But 
in the late 18th and very early 19th century, the Dutch brought methods, new methods for both for catching and even more importantly for processing herring, um, which were adopted in Scotland. And the methods for processing herring meant that they were kept much better. Herring, herring spoil very quickly because they're an oily fish and they don't keep well. So um, traditionally they were always um, dried or salted or pickled. Um, they, they could be smoked for, um, I think it was up to about six weeks at a time. You know, they, they would be like leather to eat, I think, if they were smoked for that long. But they were, they, they, there were ways of preserving them traditionally in the past. But the Dutch introduced these new methods for salting them into barrels and keeping the barrels airtight which meant that they could be exported and suddenly what had been a very poor uh, 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 large catchers but a poor fishery with not much money in it suddenly became very lucrative and it suddenly became capitalized as well so that industrialists set up these herring yards where they financed boats and yards and processing and actually paid women to be the land-based workforce to process the herring and to get it uh, packed away in, in prime condition so that it could be exported overseas. And this, this all began, as I say, in Scotland at the end of the 18th century, but it was very, very quickly taken up on the east coast of England as well. And Northumberland was kind of continuous with Scotland. Our culture was not differentiated from Scotland. There's no boundary, there's no border in the sea. So we were we were very much the same as, as, as southern Scotland. And the herring shoals travel down the east coast of the British Isles from, from way up in the north in Shetland in January. They travel slowly down to East Anglia in the autumn. And they're off the Northumberland coast about um, May, June, July time. Um, they, so they were catching them in, in the summertime. And because they're concentrated, the shoals were concentrated in one place at one time, boats from all over the country, bigger boats, not, not cobles, but keel boats, would come to fish with drift nets for these herring and try to land them as quickly as possible. And the yards would be processing them. And there was, at boom times, quite a lot of money in this. But it was a very um, unpredictable market because, of course, it depended on nature and nature is unpredictable. So there, there were lots of booms and busts in the herring industry. But the women's role was to deal with the herring as they came ashore. And what you see there is the women standing at what they called the farlands, which were a, just a big tray, really, at, at waist height. And the, the herring were dumped from a, a cart which brought them from the boats into the farlands for the women to sort them into different sizes. So this is a, um, the wall of a herring yard in sea houses, and you can see a sort of bricked up places, um, what used to be openings in that wall. And that is really just the other side of the farlands that the carts used to back up to what they called the bowly holes. And they, the, the back of the cart would open out and the tons and tons of herring would just stream into the farlands for the women on the other side to process them. Uh, this picture is is from Beadnell, my own village, and it's the women standing at the at, at the barrels, these these nearly waist high barrels that they had to pack the herring into, and they had to be packed in a very particular sort of way. After they were sort, sorted into their different sizes and gutted, they were put into these barrels in a sort of rosette pattern with layers of salt in between them and packed down very tightly. The women worked in teams of three with two to gut and, 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 and one to pack. And um, they, they, they worked incredibly quickly and they could fill, the three of them could fill a barrel like that in, in less than an hour. So they, they, they and, and, and they were paid also, you know, reasonably well for doing that. So this was the first time really women had been paid and they got some independence from doing this because all the other occupations that they had to do, like selling the fish around the doors or baiting the long lines, that was just part of the family economy. They weren't paid for that. But at the herring, this was an industry and it was capitalized and they were paid they were paid by the coopers who ran the yards this is the 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 the, the, the man at the end there is the cooper of this yard and the the, the coopers were employed by the the um the owners of the yards to manage the women they also made the barrels the coopers but the the the, the coopers were in charge of the barrels and the women so uh, the, and the women worked in 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 these teams and women from right the way down uh, up and down the coast would travel as i said as the herring shoals traveled 
the the need for the industry was in one particular place at one particular time so say it was up in shetland in january and it was in aberdeen in february or march and as the shells moved down the coast and they got to northumberland in in may june july time the women from scotland the teams would move down to northumberland and stay in lodgings and supplement the workforce so that there were actually lots of women from outside the area working in the villages where the herring were at that time and then in turn the unmarried girls from northumberland would then go off and uh, work in east anglia in, in, in Great Yarmouth and Lowestoft in the autumn time. Uh, I have a lovely quote here from, from a newspaper, if I can find it. This is the Berwick Advertiser in October 1901. Um, a large number of fish workers have gone south to Yarmouth and the other southern stations for employment. Consequently, the town will be dull for some months to come. It is regrettable that no other industry can be found here to keep these young women at home. So. Uh, that's uh, the, lamenting the, the the absence of young women in the um, from from the the, the fishing village. Um, I'd love to tell you a story about this this lady at the end of the row here. Her name was Hannah Hall, and Hannah couldn't read and write, but she'd been down to Yarmouth in her youth, and in first the First World War, uh, she 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 was terrified as as as, as people were of, of of what was going to happen. So she asked, "Is Yarmouth on war side?" Is Yarmouth on our side? And when she was told that Yarmouth was on our side, she says, "Ah, oh, we'll be all right then." So uh, yeah, she 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 hadn't travelled much in her her life, but Yarmouth was such a big and busy place. She felt if Yarmouth was on our side, we'd be we'd do all right in the in the war. So this is this is salting salting the big catch of herring in Beadnell, roughly salting it before it was processed. I'm going to have to gallop because uh, I, I realise that time is short. So I'll just I'll just go through these pictures very quickly. Oh dear, I say I'll go through them quickly, but things never things never behave when you want to do that, do they? This is the same thing at, at Craster, just dealing with a big mass of herring off the boats. This is a uh, smoking, smoking herring, kippering herring. Um, as I said, herring were traditionally smoked for a very long time, weeks at a time. But in the late 19th century, new methods were brought in for smoking them lightly. And uh, in the early part of the herring season, before they'd spawned, this was a good way of preserving them. Um, so we'll just hear another one minute extract of a woman from Seahouses talking about her life working in the herring. We started with what we call the mayhem. That was the first of the heaven coming in to see you. Mm -hmm. And I walked at the kippers until, we used to walk at the kippon yard until the uh, end of July. I liked the heaven as well. Yeah. Oh, we got pretty fun. We went to the garden. In, in the beginning of July, when the mucky colors come on in, yeah. and he sucked really? everyone. Mm -hmm. He got it into, into swirls. Yeah. Cut them swirls. Yeah. And uh, we sorted it out of them, and then we packed them into bars. Oh, and it's sort of that height. But the bottom five tiers had to be very up and straight. I mean, the men were, they were particular. We used to say the foreigners used to come and look at them. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I liked the garden. Oh, but when you walked at the you garden know. yards, you know, you started every you morning. morning. You had to be into the yard at yes. six o'clock. <coughs> <coughs> so we stay in good in heaven. <coughs> yes. when, the, when the big shots used to come in, you know, the, the, the keyboards mm -hmm. were the big shots. Mm -hmm. We started every morning at yeah. six o'clock, mm -hmm. and twelve o'clock was a common thing. But mind, we enjoyed them these when they were late, one mm -hmm. and two, yeah. because the the Helen Morton yeah. used to make for supper, yeah. and we thought that was going. That was a treat. So um, I'm just going to finish off by um, whizzing through these last pictures. Um, just a little about women's domestic lives as well. 
as as well as doing all the other things that we've talked about, knitting was a very important part of their life. Their hands were never idle. They used to make what they call gansies, which are the sweaters that fishermen wear, and sea boot stockings, as you can see in this picture here. Um, this, uh, a, a fisherman's wife and mother from New Biggin with one of her gansies. Um, another Winslow Homer painting showing knitting sea boot stockings and also mending a net. But these are clearly the archetype of the bonny fisher lass, whereas this next picture from Biedenal shows women mending a net. And these are more down to earth women. And this is, um, I think, a picture of you know, more, more, more what their lives were like. They, 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 they were enjoying themselves as they did that, but they, they, they were working all the same. Um, and another picture, again, um, just to show the, the, the continuity of this tradition, the, the, the age of this tradition. Um, this is a picture from the, from the 15th century of a woman doing exactly the same thing, using a netting needle in, in the same way. Um, as well as doing all of that, they were responsible for getting the cobalt to sea in the morning. You didn't want your man to go away to sea in wet gear. So the women used to go into the water and launch the boats and also help pull the boats up when they came home. Um, that's a very uh, romantic um, depiction of launching the lifeboat or, or I think probably pulling the lifeboat up afterwards. But women were certainly involved in heavily involved in it, both in launching cobles, pulling cobles up after they've been to sea and in in the lifeboat. And there are many, many examples of rescues where women were given medals, um, including the Boomer lifeboat um, and the Colour Coats lifeboat for absolutely astonishing feats of, 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 of helping to drag the, the boat for miles across the sand dunes when it couldn't be launched in a particular place. Um, that's the women with the lifeboat at Holy Island. Um, that's the, the Boomer lifeboat crew after one particular memorable rescue. Uh, I just want to finish with these last three pictures. This is um, a Robert Jobling picture from Colour Coats with a rather ironic title. It's a, a poem quote from Longfellow. But while darkness may be falling and people going away from their work, the women in the photo, in the painting are really just beginning their work because one is taking a net home to mend and the other is taking a creel full of mussels to bait the long lines. So the, the day's labour is not over for them. Um, this picture from, from Newbiggin shows a woman doing exactly the same thing, carrying a net on her back. And in the background there are upturned herring boats, which were used as houses, because of course the standard of living for fishermen and their families was not high at this time. And very often big families were brought up in just such conditions as these, no running water in these places and, and, and just really one room in many of the cottages. So I fin I'll finish with this picture, which I, I particularly want to show because it's often it's often used as a sort of humorous depiction of, of women in the fishing communities. But it, it, it's very interesting to me because the story behind these two women who were sisters in law is really rather a sad one. Um, the, the woman on the on the right there uh, was called Bess Morris. And she had a very hard life on Holy Island. She had several illegitimate children and they made their living as fish hawkers in the way that I was talking about the, the fish wives traveling, going for miles inland, selling the fish. At least they had cuddies, donkeys from which to sell the fish. They weren't just carrying it on their backs. But this tradition of using donkeys to carry panniers and to carry fish goes back such a long way that when Adrian Osler and I were studying the seller's accounts from Durham Priory, we found references in there to what they called fish horses. And we reckon that these, these cuddies, these donkeys on Holy Island were the late descendants of the medieval fish horses. And that there was so much in those seller's accounts in particular, the long lines which they, 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 that were being bought by the monks for the fishermen on Holy Island and Farn Island. And those long lines, they were buying 700 hooks. So exactly the same number as a half line within living memory of the, 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 the people with whom I worked. So the continuity of that tradition, I think, is really very striking. And although we have no, no evidence or not much evidence of women involved in line baiting in the medieval period, I think it's fair to assume from the way that women worked in selling and processing fish at that time, and uh, that they pro were probably just doing the same thing, but doing it invisibly. 
as so much of women's history is invisible. So I'm, I'm very sorry that's been such a gallop, but I would like to finish just by reading, quickly reading a poem, because I'm, I did mention the Fisher Poets at the beginning of this, and the Fisher Poets gathering takes place every February, last week, weekend of February, on, um, in Astoria, in, in, on, on the West Coast, and um, they're, they're, they're performing online this year, so I would recommend everybody goes and listens to the Fisher Poets, look them up online. And this is, this is a poem which I've read at the Fisher Poets gathering before about Kathy, Kathy who is in that, that picture. I'll, I'll stop sharing now so you can see me and I'll just read the poem and then there'll be time for questions. I'm sorry it was such a gallop. Kathy. See yon hyuk, says Kathy. Yon's my life. Three quarters of an inch of steel, barbed at the hutter, bent, it glitters like a jewel. Tiny, Kathy, six stone, volatile as petrol, wiry, lean, puts on her shawl. Pleased to see you, kettle on, deaf as a sharpening stone to every sound, except the wireless static crackle from the boat. A little whirlwind. She pegs the sheets out in the backyard, scrubs the step, stirs the pan, swabs the floor. When Feather heard it was another girl, he slammed the door. Aye, but he couldn't day with you doubters, you know. Kathy, bent beneath the creel, home from the mussel beds, the limpet pool, six stone of haddocks, hark the rune reed ra. Husband, in-laws, tugging at her, kin, needing her care. Muscles to scheme, the boat to launch, lines to bait, clays to poss, sons to bear. Kathy, bent with pains, years, busy as a sandaling, never still, down the harbour with the barrow, eyes blue as the coquette, bright as steel, as hard, as sharp, as necessary as a fish hook, to the house, the men. Kathy, without whom a cobalt could not go to sea, as vital to it as diesel or the wind. Thank you. Yeah, thank, oh my God, Katrina. <laughs> thank you so much. That was lovely. Um, well, great talk. We're very grateful you were able to come. And, and of course, thank you to our sponsors uh, who I mentioned at the beginning. I also do want one last plug since you mentioned uh, women's work. We do have an exhibit in the gallery that uh, here at the center, but there is a digital version of the exhibit too, which I'm going to put in the chat. You can explore whenever you would like, but it does talk about, you know, a lot of the stuff that Katrina touched on, like how it's uncommon at the in the hist in history for women to be, but their work is kind of always um, there and very important to the fishing industry so be, for, be sure to check that out but thank you so much yeah do you guys have any questions that you would like to either you can put in the chat you can unmute whatever you guys feel comfortable with katrina can you hear me yes i can yes hi hi i'm i'm from newcastle and i know that coast like the back of my hand but I, I remember the color coats lasses in the hay market in Newcastle at the end of the 40s. Yes. And uh, I can remember that with the creels outside, there was a, 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 an old stone building where they used to sit outside. But I, I was probably only six years old. But how wonderful to have seen the, 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 really the end of that very, very long tradition. Yeah. Maybe you yeah. should tell people a stone's 14 pounds. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, uh, the, some of, it, the needed other, some of some, it needed translation, Michael. I know. <laughs> the other, the other, I was just going to bring up the dialect. I wonder how many people here could understand that dialect. We have uh, on PBS, we have Vera over here now. Um, but, uh, and a lot of people listen to it. But that Northumbrian accent brought so much back to me so i want to thank you oh thank you it's good to hear their voices isn't it i wanted i wanted their voices in the talk not not my voice but their voices thanks henny no oh, thanks henny <laughs> <laughs> car <canny. laughs> hi nina 
Oh, hello, hello, hello. Lovely to see you, Katrina. Thanks and thank you very can I th can I thank Alison for um I, I'm, my name's Nina Brown and I'm a trustee at the old low light heritage center in North Shields um we currently have an exhibition on called that's women's work and um all the subjects that um Katrina has been talking about we've you know we've got, got included in our exhibition um and so it's very kind of you to invite us along to this it's lovely to have that connection you know uh, uh, across the sea Thank you very much. And we're hoping that Katrina will be able to come and see the exhibition sometime soon. So thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Nina. Okay. <laughs> Super exciting. I thought it was so funny that you guys had something very similar. Um, and we're both doing it at the same time. <laughs> like, what? Yeah. what the <laughs> well, like Katrina said, we sometimes we've done a lot of exhibitions about the fishermen, you know, and, and they're, it's, it's a, they're, they're very brave. It's a very challenging job they have. But we sort of felt that the women's story had been missed. And uh, so that's what we wanted to include. Um, and uh, hopefully that's what we've, that's the story we've told. Do you have um, is. Is it just um, physical? Is there like a link or something that I can share in the chat? Um, well, we've got um, we've got a um, obviously we've got a, a, a website, we've got a Twitter mm -hmm. feed, and a Facebook page. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to see some of the exhibition yeah. uh, on there. Uh, if that's any use, um, I can. I'm happy. I think I've got your email, Alison. I, yes. Uh, thanks to, to Katrina. So I can certainly send you those links if uh, if Please, you like yeah. Help. Yeah, that would be great. Great. Thank and if you. you're ever this side, if you're ever this side of the Atlantic, of course you'd be very welcome to visit. <laughs> Any other questions, Nancy? I see you're unmuted. Do you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, that was really wonderful, Katrina. Thank you so much. I was curious to know. Do you have any sense of what the populations were for some of these small towns along the coast? Yes, um, the, B Boomer, where, where the lifeboat rescue took place, had a population of 150 people. Ah. And, and, and my village of Bedenal was not very much more. It was a, you know, maybe 300 at, at, at its most uh -huh. in the 19th century. Right. The, 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 the places further south on the coast, like colour coats, were much bigger. Uh -huh. There were about there were about 80 kobolds going from colour coats at the end of the 19th century. And if you think there were about three to four men in each cobalt, um, you can kind of extrapolate from that what the fishing population was of that yeah. village. But 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 it, colour coats mer merged into North Shields and, and Tynemouth and that sort of area. It was much more urban, whereas the villages further north on the Northumberland mm -hmm. coast were very, very rural. So I was trying to talk about a, a continuity of tradition, but what, one which became more urbanized as you got towards the industrial areas. I mean, I was trying to, the trouble was I was trying to truncate a talk, you know, which probably should have taken about six hours to give really. There, was, there, was a, there were a lot of different subjects in the talk, but, mm -hmm. but the, 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 the fish wives and, and that kind of, that particular archetype belonged more to the industrial areas. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. the women in the small villages of populations of about 150 to 300 people were doing the same things. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, the, the fellow that um, Mike uh, uh, Taylor that asked you the question um, and myself are both uh, docents at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And recently we've been trying to talk up whaling wives quite a bit more. Yeah. Uh, it seems they didn't get enough attention, you know. Yeah. And it's been really interesting to delve into their personal lives and the kind of women that went out with their husbands on these voyages, you know, ran the gamut. Yes, yes, absolutely. No, I don't, I don't know very much about whaling. There's a, a scholar in the Northeast called Tony Barrow, who's done a lot of work on whaling, but whether he's done any work on the women, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, their their lives sort of were footnotes, as you say, um, for yeah. quite some time. It's, there's been more research done recently, but not a whole lot. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, great that you're great. I'd be I'd be very interested in anything that you've that you have. Have you published on 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 that subject? Or? Oh, certainly not. I'm no scholar. Um, just just a, a learning docent. But uh, we we have done quite a bit of reading, and the the museum is really wonderful in terms of allowing us to do uh, specialized programs here and there. So yeah, yeah. But I mean. I, I, Although I had a kind of academic background in in a in a different life a long time ago, most of the the real work I've done doesn't sort of count as proper proper history because it was just talking to people. Yeah, you know, it was just gathering memories, and then I've I've been able to kind of correlate that with more academic research at, at times in my life but but m most of it is 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 simply word of mouth so what you're doing is yeah. you know it, it's the real it's the real thing if you're talking to people who've had that experience or you know finding out that that that's there's there's yeah. you know that that that, that that's real history sure you're getting course. it from a first hand source <laughs> <laughs> thank you no oh, thank you it, it's very it's all really interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's also a very, some very cool comments in the chat. Thank you. Also, thank you for all the lovely sentiments, but um, there's some cool links in there too. There's one shared by Lynn Williamson um, about Holy Isle and its medieval connections to fishing. Um, Christina Brown from Old Low Light. And then Laura um, put in the Fisher Poets website which um, Katrina is part of. And then they also have more people <laughs> um, that happens on the West Coast uh, later in the month. Be sure to check those out. Do you guys have any other questions? You can put them in the chat. You can unmute whatever you feel comfortable with. Personally, I just, I was so excited. <laughs> I was so excited to hear this talk and I'm really glad that it went the way that it did. And um, I'm glad we could have Katrina come see us virtually. Yes, I see Eric Davison has his hand up. Hi, Eric, do you want to, do you want to say something? Eric Davison? We've got we've got two hands up, Alison. Do you do you want to do you want to invite one of them to to? Eric, you're un, you're muted. If you wanted to say something. Maybe maybe, we'll, he's, we'll give him maybe a, he's clapping. Yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> we'll give him a we'll give him a second. Madeline, do you have do you have something you want to say? I I just wanted to um, mention that. Uh, we, the herring industry here on the East Coast uh, is, has changed quite radically, but I was fortunate enough to be able to help collect some oral histories of the last women who worked in the cannery in, uh, in Maine, the last herring cannery on the East Coast, and they had worked there for about 50 years. So we saw a whole range or heard a whole range of of their history and so the what fascinates me is the parallels about history i mean about fishing and the women that have worked in fishing for for eons and i i said in the in the mention in the chat that i did some work in west africa and there were parallels there and i i my first foray into learning about the fishing industry was in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and I'd go out on the boats and the conversations I had there were duplicates of conversations I had about five years later in West Africa. So it, it's just, that's one of the fascinating things about fishing is the commonalities, even though the technology is very different and even the fisheries can be very different. There are so many similar ideas and, and experiences. So this has been fascinating. I, I'm, I'm so thrilled that you were able to to do this for us and thank oh, you th thank you so much i would love to talk with you about about those commonalities because i've, I've long suspected that i think i think the more 
kind of basic really the the the, the community is and the closer to nature it is really you know the the the, the more common the experiences worldwide and and i really i really wanted to argue in that talk and there just wasn't time but the the, the continuity of that tradition in northumberland shows something about sustainability and mm. sustainability is something that matters to us all so much now and we have so much to learn from those lives about it. But it, what we also have to think about is the, the cost of it, the cost of that sustainability in human terms, you know, and I'm sure that's true in West Africa also, that the, the, the kinds of the interactions with nature that do the least damage are also the ones that are hardest on people. And it's trying to find a balance between those things, I think is really is really hard. It's a really hard question for our times, I think. Yeah, but thank you for that observation. It's uh, I'd, I'd love to talk with you about it. Oh. Yeah, so Eric, I see that you put in the chat, you have a query. You can write it in the chat, you can unmute, whatever, whatever you would like to do. Thank you, Madeline. I always love hearing about your adventures. <laughs> Does Eric know that he's muted? He's, he's written in the chat that he has a query. You can type in the chat too, Eric, if it's easier. Very excited for your query. <laughs> Hi, Ian. Hi there. Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm sitting in Wick, which of course oh, wow. is, is <laughs> the, the herring capital of Europe. Uh, <laughs> maybe you can you can see behind me the the, the, the picture of the of the busyness of of uh, Pulteney Town Harbour in the the 1860s, and uh, obviously the the women were very important here in terms in terms of the the herring girls, the gutting and the packing, and obviously yeah. similarities to what you've been talking about. Uh, I just wanted to mention that that we have a you, you talked about the Sutcliffe uh, photographic collection, but we have quite a, a striking one as well in the Johnston photographic collection, uh, which uh, depicts quite a lot about the fishing, the people, the processes, and the boats. I think and the and the harbours as well. So uh, yeah, visit uh, wick, wickheritage.org and uh, you'll you'll find all about uh, the herring capital of Europe. And and the funny thing is, Ian, there's a close connection between my tiny little village, Beadnell, and Wick, because there was something called the 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 um the British Fisheries, the the organisation of British Fisheries, yes. um, and and Pulteney Town, I think, was was founded as part of that. Am I right? That, that's that's correct. Pulteney Town was 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 built and as you say, funded by the British Fisheries Society initially. Yes, the British Fisheries Society. Well, the landlord of Beadnell, John Wood, wanted to to found the 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 Northern English branch of the British Fisheries, and he kind of twinned Beadnell with Wick, and some of your some of your lobsters were exported from Wick to Beadnell and kept in the water in Beadnell before being sent down to to London on smacks. All right, okay, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. extraordinary for for a short time, Beadnell, Beadnell, a tiny little place like Beadnell. I mean, he had extravagant and 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 ridiculous ambitions. This man would, <laughs> but but he want he he wanted he was an industrialist and he want he wanted to make that connection with Pulteney Town. And, and was he on the, the British Fisheries Board then? He was, yes. Yeah. 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 The Northumberland branch of the look look for the Northumberland branch of the British Fisheries. Okay. Okay. <laughs> But thank you. That thank yeah, you. I mean, that, Wick was indeed the the the, the capital of, of 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 all of that. And and herring was really only a small part of our our year. You know, it was only really about three months of the the year in in villages on the Northumberland coast. Um, I have a question, uh, sort of a crazy question. In all of your research, um, did you not find anything you were expecting to find? 
<laughs> did, did I did I find anything I was not expecting to find? You mean? Yeah, or the opposite, right? <laughs> did I not, or, or did I not find anything I was expecting to find? <laughs> what a question! <laughs> Do you know one of the things I didn't find much about was about the effect of this on women's health and particularly pregnancy? You know, going down on the rocks and gathering all that bait, which they did practically up until they gave gave birth. You know, there must have been terrible effects, but women didn't really talk about that at all. They um, were so I, heavy. I mean, uh, you know, for yeah. however many stone you mentioned, six stone is something like 85 pounds or so. Yeah, that's right. On your back. Yeah, that's right. And they, they, they did it because they had to, because it was, you know, you, you worked or you didn't eat, you know, so they, they, they had to do it and they kept on having children. And it's certainly true that women's mortality was much higher than men. I mean, men, men lost their lives at sea in terrible numbers because Kobe was overturned and, 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 you know, there were, there were lots of disasters, but women died young and they often died in childbirth. And I would love to know mm -hmm. more about how that compares with say mining villages where, um, you know, where women also had hard lives, but their, 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 their work was different and much more domestic. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't find, or women didn't talk much about, right. about that kind of thing, miscarriage and, and, yeah. and, and just the general effects on their health and mortality. Yeah, I wonder if, if they considered it just all a part of their lives, their regular lives, you know. They did, they did, they did. Mm -hmm. But that the the launching the boats was, was was also interesting because I do know that before the Second World War, a number of families moved from Newbiggin. You saw that picture of, of the women, the black and white picture of the women launching the Kobel at Newbiggin during the war. And before the war, a number of families moved from Newbiggin to Amble up the coast. Now, Amble had a harbour, and that was the reason they moved there, because they were so uh, affected by having to launch the boats. It was such hard work. Mm -hmm. And going into the water in the wintertime, you know, a number of women got pneumonia and died. So their families moved up to Amble, really, to, to protect the women from having to do that. And if there was a harbour, then they didn't have to go in the water to launch the boats. What a hard life. Terrible, terrible. You see, we can look back on it and say, well, it was a, you know, it was a, it was a beautiful way of life, and it was in many ways, as Homer depicted it, and it was certainly a sustainable way of life, which is is, is fascinating for our times because we want a sustainable fishery, but it was sustainable at the expense of this terrible mm -hmm. hard work. Yes, yeah. and that wasn't very long ago, really. When you think about it, it really wasn't it really wasn't and in terms of how long it lasted you know it lasted all those hundreds of years and it was still it it's still just within living memory just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah amazing so i see david kidd has had his hand up very patiently if you would like to ask a question thank you uh, i'm speaking from the depths of the northeast the very windy northeast at the moment uh, i'm a trustee of an organization called the Kobe and Kiribo Society. Uh, we exist to promote the heritage of the inshore fishing communities of Northeast England. We have a website, we have a Twitter account, and if anybody would uh, like to follow us, uh, we're easily found through Google. The Twitter account is updated daily and if you're interested in the weather on the northeast coast for fishermen, you can see it there. And we are honoured to have Katrina as our president. Thank you, David. I've, ju I've just been I've just been appointed president, so it's a, it's a, it's my honour, really. It's a it's a great honour. So uh, do, doing a talk like this, giving a talk like this is um, a way of delivering everything that's been given to me over so many years, really. And that's what I hope to be able to do through the Kobel and Keelboat Society. Thank you. Uh, I've all, one, I noticed somebody mentioned whaling. I've ordered a book through a bookseller here on women in whaling in Nantucket. Uh. Uh, where it's the lives of women uh, in Nantucket, because I was rereading Moby Dick, and one of the things you notice is Captain Ahab got married, then he went away for three years. <laughs> uh, 
And the women of Nantucket seem to describe themselves as widows. Yes, yes. Because yeah. they never saw their husbands. Right. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a large number of women from Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and places along the Connecticut and New York coast whose husbands went to sea. Um, and they just got tired of, of not having a continuous relationship with their husbands. That's why many of them went. Uh, yeah. my, my family are seagoing people. And I'll always remember my aunt whose husband was a third engineer on a tramp steamer, which could go anywhere around the world with coal. And he was away for nine months, a year, 18 months. And she was a very independent woman. And if you talk to her, you would never realize she was married. And she told me off the record when he wasn't there that the worst day of her life was when he actually retired and came back to live with her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nantucket women became very independent uh, and, you know, ran things on the island when their husbands were not there. Yeah, it was a tradition in the Northeast, in pit villages as well as uh, fishing communities, that the women did the fine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was also to do with literacy, David. Yes, yes. The mortality, oh, do we have any? the mortality in uh, fishing, small boat fishing, corbels that Katrina was talking about, was probably greater per head of population in the village than it was in mine. Uh, I've come across a case where there was a man giving evidence at an inquest, where this was at the end of the 19th century, and he described how he was the last surviving male member of his family of 18. That includes uh, the extended family. So 17 of those families of fishermen had died at sea. Uh, Alison, er Eric has just put something in the chat to say that he, he he's he's muted and he can't uh, the host has to allow him to speak yes he, yes um you have to well, i was gonna get yeah thank you for your patience eric eric I don't know. I feel I I feel for Eric because uh, I, I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to get through to you. I don't I don't know. Um, I don't know if we're going to be able to or not. But who have we got here? I think if Eric, he might want to leave the meeting and come back in. I promise we'll let okay. you back in. But I don't, I've sent him an invitation to unmute. That's all I know how to do. Right. Yeah. He has to unmute himself. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Good Technology, am I right? <laughs> Bye, Ian. <laughs> okay, well, Eric, if you want to um, email me your question, my, pro my email is programs at the little at sign fishingheritagecenter.org. Um, I can forward it on to Katrina and she can answer it that way if that works. Okay. 
thank you. Thank you for your flexibility. All right, yeah. So we're gonna, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Thank you guys for all your awesome questions. Thank you, Katrina, for your awesome talk. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Your lunch hour in 20 minutes. <laughs> thank you so Lots much. You. Thank, thank you to everybody for, 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 for staying with us and for all your brilliant questions and the conversation. It's been fantastic. Really enjoyed it. And thank you, Alison, and, 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 and everyone at the, at the Fishing Heritage Centre. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Take care, Bye. guys. Bye. Bye.